joining us today online. We're so glad that you could be here with us. If you're joining us from Facebook or YouTube, don't forget to press like or subscribe to our channel. If you're a guest with us, we would love if you could type new in the chat. Let us know you're here. Another thing you could do is press get connected and uh, that will help us be able to connect with you and let you know the updates here at French Church. I was reading in my devotional today and I came across something that I wanted to share with you. Um, it's by Lincoln Brewster and I thought this was very applicable in this time of waiting and being at home and knowing that that might be happening for a little bit longer. When we worship, we take our eyes off our problems and unfulfilled promises. We set our hearts on God. In his presence, we find his comfort and we realize we aren't alone in the midst of our wait. There's so much about waiting that feels out of our control. Want to wait well? Start by worshiping God. Let's worship together this morning. Let's get connected with God. And I'm going to start us off with prayer. Dear Jesus, thank you so much for today and for bringing all these people here. I pray for their health, their safety. I pray for their comfort and your peace to come over them. I pray that you help us today connect with you, to worship you, and to learn more about you. And um, we worship you today. In Jesus' name, amen. An orphan lost at the fall, running away when I'd hear you call. But Father, you worked your will. I had no righteousness of my own, I had no right to join in your throne. But Father, you love me still. Hands in love before you lay the foundation you predestined to adopt me as your own you have raised me up so high above my station I'm a child of God my grace and grace alone you left your home to seek out the lost you knew the great and terrible cost. Jesus, your face was set. So I worked my fingers down to the bone. Nothing I did could ever atone. Jesus, you paid my debt. By your blood, I have redemption and salvation. Lord, you died that I might reap what you have sown. And you rose that I might be a new creation. I am born again by grace and grace alone. I was in darkness all of my life. I never knew the day from the night. That you made me see. And I swore I knew the way on my own. Head full of rocks and heart made of stone. The spirit you moved in me. At your touch, my sleeping spirit was awakened. For my darkened heart, and the light. Called into a kingdom that cannot be shaken. Heaven set us in my grace and grace alone. So I'll stand in faith by grace and grace alone. I will run the race by grace and grace alone. I will slay my 
us clean hands, give us pure hearts, let us not lift our souls to another, give us clean hands, give us pure hearts, let us not lift our souls to another. Good morning, friends. It's good to be with you. We are talking about today, getting it back. Uh, We've been talking about getting back our passion and getting back our confidence, which is not our confidence, but God confidence and getting back our encouragement. I hope last week you were encouraged that God is in control. Amen. The big idea of this uh, series is basically this. The enemy comes to steal. The, the, the reality is that life and circumstances and uh, our own choices sometimes can remove and hinder God's blessings and God's resources for our lives. And so we need to get back what was stolen, what was surrendered, what was lost. And that's the whole idea behind this series. And today is the same um, I've proposed throughout this whole thing that the big idea is that um, being in God and God in you is the source of all these things. In theos uh, means uh, in uh, enthusiastic, in encouraged, passionate, because God is inside of us. The idea of of being uh, God confident because. We are confident because God is in us and working through us. And then our encouragement um, in faith, that our faith and our trust is what brings that encouragement. Today, we're going to be talking about how love is that same kind of idea. Love is a fruit. It's an outflow. It's a consequence of his presence, of his grace and love in our lives. And so this morning, as we consider this whole topic, I just want to remind you, this is not a uh, self-improvement 
type seminar. So please don't hear me in that way. I'm wanting to encourage us. It is a call to return. It's a call to rediscover. It's a call to experience uh, God in a new way and know his love. That he, he has all the answers. He provides everything for us and everything we need to flourish. Even in a time like this, we can flourish and God can be more real and more present than in everyday life in the times of difficulty and stress. See, love is the main message of scripture. I mean, you got to know that. I mean, God is love. He's defined as he is love. It says that for God so loved the world that he came I mean, the whole message of the gospel, the whole message of the, the scripture is that God is love. And in fact, it says that the church will be known by their love. And so uh, this topic that we're going to be talking about today is, is absolutely critical. It is important for us to grapple with and to get. And uh, the, the reality is, is this world is longing for love. In fact, you might be longing for love right now. You know, in times of stress and in times of trial, the first thing that comes into our hearts, we begin to ask questions. We begin to say, God, do you know what's going on? Do you see what's going on? Are you in control? Or in this time, do I need to fight my own battle? I need to know that, God. If you're not going to fight for me, then I need to fight the battle, right? See, we need that, that loving confidence, that security that comes through knowing that we are loved. You know, our kids need love right now. As they've been separated from their friends, our loved ones need love. Our society needs a great deal of, of love. And I'm not just talking about love Sweet love. You like that singing, right? I'm not talking about merely acts of kindness. I'm not talking about virtue signaling, which is going on all throughout culture. That if we just act a certain way, then we really connect with the, the ideas and stuff like that. So uh, I talked about um, love a couple weeks ago, and that was our... God, our, our love for God and how to renew that passion, okay? But I'm not talking about that. I'm talking more about um, his love and his calling to love others. And so that's where we'll be. Let's start in 2 Timothy chapter 3 today. And uh, it says this in chapter 3, verses 1 through 5. But mark this, there will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, again, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, uh, brutal, not lovers of the good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power. This is a very interesting passage because it speaks to the later times in history, and it says uh, that, that there will be terrible times in the last days. I just want to tell you, uh, as we get closer to the end of Jesus coming back, times will get tough. The world will seem to go nuts and crazy around us. But guess what? That is just birth pangs. That is what we're facing right now. This passage we've read so many times probably, and it, it kind of reminds us of how bad the world is, and we can look at the world, and every generation can look outside of the church and say, oh yeah, the world is, is becoming very bad. It seems like it's getting worse. But you know what? This, this passage is not just about that. 
It's not just a discourse of bad people and contrasting church people. You are the good people, they are the bad people. In fact, I think this says something even to us and to this topic this morning. Notice all the places in this passage where it talks about love. What were their focuses of their love? Love of themselves, love of money. They were without void or devoid of love. They were not lovers of good. That means they embraced bad and evil. They were lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. And and here's the key verse here. Having a form of godliness, but denying its power. So sometimes we tack that on and say, oh, that's just saying that there will be some who have a, they appear to be godly, but they're not. But it's actually applicable to all those previous verses. See, I believe that the kind of love the world pursues and talks about and thinks, thinks about and sings about is, is a form of its own righteousness, its own godliness of sorts, the God of this world. But it is vacant and it is powerless See, the world is filled with false love. And I think sometimes the church can get the wrong idea of what love really is. And so uh, I just want to begin with this and say that we need, what we need is love. You know, just like the Beatles. I didn't say all we need, but um, Jesus says this in Matthew chapter 22, verse 36 through, 34, or through 40. Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment, and the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. And he goes on, and he says, all the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. See, it says here, the first thing, love God with everything you have. There is a call that we've got to love God with everything we have. That means our heart, our soul, our mind, our strength, everything about us needs to love God. That's the first call. But then it goes on and says, oh, and there's a second one. Love your neighbors too. Okay, we get the love God part, but the love neighbors part? Wow. And then he goes on and he makes it even uh, more powerful. He says, all the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. That means loving God and loving our neighbor fulfills the law. And therefore, um, the, the idea that, that God has called us to love is critically important. It's, he's called us to love him, and he's called us to love others, but he's not just saying fake it, have a false love. He wants us to love with true, authentic love that he's provided the pathway for. Let's talk about this for a second. In Romans chapter 13, verse 8, it says this, let no debt remain outstanding. We always look at that and say, okay, we're not supposed to have debts. You know, uh, we're not to bankrupt ourselves. Um, But this is talking about something else. He says, accept the continuing debt to love one another. For For whoever loves others has fulfilled the law. You see what that verse did? It removed the love of God element and just said, for whoever loves others have fulfilled the law. Because it is a complete connection. If we love God, we will love others. The only way to love others is through the love of God because he changes us from the inside out. As Christians, how do we respond in times like these? This passage says we are indebted to love. We, we owe it. The, the, the bill is due regularly. See, love fulfills the law. All the commandments can be summed up in love. I mean, we know the verses. It says, love your neighbor as yourself. See, love does no harm to 
to your neighbor. Love. It, you know, if, if we would really understand this, uh, this would solve all the problems of our society if we loved. If we loved our neighbor, we wouldn't murder them. If we loved our uh, neighbor, we wouldn't lie to him. If we loved our neighbor, we wouldn't steal from him. Our problem today and as a culture, and this is why the church and our response is so critically important, is our problem is a love problem. See, the world loves things. They love themselves. They love pleasure. They love power. But God says in an upside down world, love covers a multitude of sins. Love is the answer. We have a love problem in our culture and in our society. Excuse me. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, we are never going to be at peace with God in our culture. Peace uh, with God only comes through knowing God. So we want a peaceful society. But here's the thing. The less and less of God means the less and less of peace. Where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. See, this, this is critical. Peace for everyone comes as we live out love in our lives with one another. And so, with one another and with our neighbors, I should say. So, um, the, the, the whole point here is the problem is a love problem. And church, God was not surprised that all this is going on. He doesn't look at our culture and say, Oh, they're really naughty now. Uh-oh, I'm surprised by this. No, he knew the solution to sin and mankind is, is love, is grace, is mercy, is forgiveness. And so he established the church and he said, they will know you by your love. That means love is not just a, a bonus to this whole thing. It is part of God's solution. See, we know the, the passage that God's solution was a love solution. In John 3, 16, it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. See, because of God's love, he sent his son. And we are saved when we believe in him. We will have eternal life. We will not perish. Now, that doesn't mean we won't die in this world. Sometimes we do die. I mean, everyone dies unless Jesus comes uh, before we do. So it goes on in verse 17. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. So God's plan is not to separate Christians and then the world and say, you guys good, you guys bad. He came into the world that he saves people, and through that salvation, we love others, and his love spreads like a virus. It is an uncontrollable outbreak of the grace and the mercy of God as we point to him, and as we come into contact with him, he changes hearts from the inside. I don't care what everybody thinks the solutions are. Man's political solutions are are vacant compared to God's eternal plan of salvation and love and transformation by his grace. The spreading of that through his church. See, we tend to teach kids, uh, those of you who have kids, or, or maybe you're a teacher, you teach kids you know, right and wrong and how to behave through fear and through pride. We do that oftentimes, you know, um, if you misbehave, you will get a whooping. Or if you do this, you will make me sad. 
You know, we're, we're, we're trying to create a fear. If, if you do this, you're going to be a bad kid. Do you want to be a bad kid? If you do that, the, the other kids may not like you. Or other kids won't do that. Why should you? And so we shame, we use fear, we use pride sometimes to get things done, quote, right. The Pharisees used that model as well. They tried to um, say these are the, the things. They tried to define it so they could, you know, if you don't do this, you should be afraid of God. But God's plan, God, instead of the fear and pride model, uses the grace model. God says, this love I give to you is by grace. Experience it, know it, and then go give it. Amen? So God is not what God does. I, I want to do a little bit of a background teaching on this. God does not, is not what God does, but love is not what God does. I'm sorry. But love is who God is. See, this is where we get a mistake uh, in this idea of love, that it's, it's merely actions, and because of those actions, we're better or we're right. The thing is, it is God's very essence and nature. He defines love. There is no love outside of God. There is his love. Now there's degrees, and the Bible even mentions these, you know, uh, agape, God kind of love, phileo, friendship love, eros, which is sexual love. Um, but it says in 1 John chapter 4, verse 8, it says, Whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. So some people say, well, if I love, then I must know God. I'm kind, therefore I must know God. No. This, it, it doesn't go backwards, it goes forwards here. Is, is if we don't love, we don't know God. So this is a call to Christians saying, we got to check our hearts. Are we loving? Are we loving others among us? Are we loving the world even though it's dying in sin and, and anguishing and in turmoil? In 1 John chapter 4, verses 10 and 11, it says this, This is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. See, that, that's a verse directly to us in this time. It's not about how much we love God. It's, how, it's that God loved us so much. Because he loved us so much, we must love God one another. So quickly, the best, I, I read, I heard about this in, in the purpose driven life in, uh, I think it's chapter 16 or day 16, actually. Um, he talks about love and, and this kind of thing. And he uses this phrase. He says, the best use of life is love. You know, and that's so true. We need to go after a life of love, church. And that's my call. We need to get it back. We need to go after a life of love. We need to measure ourselves. We need to measure our faith by our love. And, and that love means not just acts of kindness, but our heart, our attitudes, our motive of why we're doing certain things. See, look at this. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 1 in your notes. It says, let love be your highest goal. New Living Translation. Let love be your highest goal. The other translations talk about pursuing love and those things, but it doesn't give the, the depth of what that pursuing means. It means as utmost importance pursue. And so um, we need to, to live uh, our lives in love. He goes on, Mark chapter 12. Jesus said this, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength, love your neighbor as yourself. Requote of Matthew 22 that we saw, showed earlier. There is no commandment 
greater than these. That's Jesus' direct words. Galatians chapter 5 verse 6 says this. The only thing that counts is faith expressing itself in love. What really counts? Our trust in God. Our acceptance of his love for us and how we live that out. How we express that in love. That means we've got to be the most loving people. We've got to be transformed by God's love so that we can, in in faith, love others. It's hard to love when you're disagreeing, right? It's hard when, when things are so tumultuous. How do you still love in conflict? That's the time we gotta love. It goes on, it says, the entire law is summed up in a single command, love your neighbor as yourself in Galatians 5, 14. It goes on, above all, love each other deeply in 1 Peter. Above all. And then in 1 Corinthians 13, 13, it says three things that will last forever. Faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these is love. I mean, there's a quick survey of Scripture, and it's saying the highest goal. There's no greater commandment. The only thing that counts. The entire law is summed up. Above all, love each other. Love is the greatest of the things that remain. And 1 Corinthians 13, 8 says, love never fails. It is a winning plan. It is a a way, if we would grasp this, if if we'd get back our love, You know, and it's not love for God. It's recognizing his love for us and then living it out amongst us. Okay, so here's here's the application for us. If we're going to live like Jesus lived, we have got to love like Jesus loved. This does not come naturally for us. It doesn't come naturally for me because I catch myself all the time not being loving because I'm irritated, I'm angry, I'm frustrated with people as I shop or try to get a solution. Um, it's more than just acting kind. You know, love is not just God says, I saved you, so act kind. No, that's not what it says. In fact, I had a kind of an aha moment this week reading 1 Corinthians chapter 13. We know what that passage is, right? It's the love chapter. Every wedding, they read it. Um, It's even quoted in Wedding Crashers, the movie. Uh, Anyway, um, he won a bet saying, I bet you they're going to read 1 Corinthians 13. Anyway, it says this in verse 3. It says, if I, and I put a blank in your notes because he's, he's just been talking about all the things we could do that are grandiose and great, and some of them are doing the miraculous surrendering your life, sacrificing your life. And he says, if I do all that, but do not have love, it profits me nothing. Wait a second. I thought, I thought you could give, lay down your life. That's the utmost. I mean, well, it is. But you can lay down your life, but with the wrong motive. You're loving, you're wanting to be a hero. You're wanting to protect someone you love, which is good. But Jesus, his ultimate was, you've got to love motivated by the love that you've experienced in God. Because it profits us nothing just to be kind with one another. Even though we should, scripture implores us to do that. But it shows it's not just the act that is important. It is the motivation as well. It is the heart. It's from where it flows. If, if someone's indoctrinated all their, all their life, codependence, that you just got to take care and be nice to people and it'll be good for them. And what have you discovered? Your niceness is taken for granted all the time and abused. So God has not called us just to be codependent with a world and just be loving and stand by while everybody hates us. Instead, what I believe it says is that we are to love fully and completely motivated by his love. I heard this story about Satchel Paige, who was the uh, first African-American pitcher 
in uh, Major League Baseball or American Baseball. And he used to just get berated and torn apart by the racist in the stands. And he was asked one time, how do you, how do, you do that? How do you, how do you live you know, with, with all that? And he said, I have to forgive them and love them as if they didn't hurt me. Like I've never been hurt by them. See, he, he had this idea, he understood that it wasn't just, um, you know, being kind to other people in the face of that. He had to actually live out faith in that situation. See, true love flows from being loved. We actually become love through being loved by our God. God has called us to practice our love with one another in the church. That is part of what's going on and the frustration that many of us are feeling is we've got to be together. We've got to love on one another. How do we do that while we're separated? Yes, there's phones. Yes, there's text. Yes, there's Zoom. You know, and those are all great, but we need to love one another and we need to practice it. We need to bear one another's burdens. We need to pray for one another, all the one another's in scripture. And so, um, we, we were supposed to practice in the church, but then it doesn't stop in the church walls. It goes out to our neighbors. So what does this look like? If, if we're going to um, live like Jesus lived, therefore we must love like Jesus loved. What does that look like? How did Jesus love? I mean, I could summarize it in a real quick way. He, it looked like forgiveness. It looked like serving and blessing and encouraging. And it looked like breaking bread. What I mean by that is intimacy and fellowship and, and experiencing life together. So if you look at Jesus' life, he was going about talking about the kingdom of God and preaching that and talking about grace and forgiveness. The, the women who was being stoned, he who is without sin cast the first stone. Uh, he, then he said, go and sin no more. He, he practiced forgiveness. His, his whole sacrifice of himself is the utmost of forgi forgiveness. He took the penalty that we owed that he didn't owe. He, he paid the penalty we could never pay and only he could pay. Serving, he came and, and before he left, he got down on his knees with a ba basin and water and a towel and he washed his disciples' feet. He served. I did not come to be served, but I came to serve. He came to seek and save the lost. We serve not just acts of kindness, but seeking salvation, seeking experience with God, seeking the grace of God distributed in the world. And yes, that can be done in small ways like giving of food and, and, and uh, hugs and prayers and support and sometimes calling people out in exhortation saying, stop, your life is being ruined and there's a way out through a deliverer. And so, and then ultimately breaking bread, what was Jesus condemned for? He, he ate with sinners. Um, see, he was all about intimacy. He hung out with his disciples. He walked with them. He shared life with them, experiences. He'd slowly taught them to live their their life in Jesus's way. And, and it always fell back on love. See, if you're missing in-person per services, I, I'm, I'm assuming all of us are missing in-person services. I just encourage you, especially now, to get into a group. You know, be safe in that. Socially distance, you know, protect yourselves, those kinds of things. But find a way, whether it's online or in person in a safe way, um, and share life together. Pray for one another in this time. I heard this story of Tr uh, John Trent, who tells about a dad who 
kind of experienced and learned that, you know, he thought he spent like 15 to 20 minutes a day with his children and uh, uh, actually was observed and it was discovered that he only spent 37 seconds of the day with his daughter. 37 seconds. And he was utterly flabbergasted by this. And so he decided um, that all of his travel, he had read a, uh, a um, I guess some of what she was writing in a journal that he was, you know, just really happy and pleased with his family. And the daughter was saying, I just don't know. It makes me so unhappy that my dad has gone so much. And so he decided to begin to encourage her. And so he specifically made breakfast for them, sat down, and he said, before we eat, and then he went in to just tell her how much she was worth to him, how much he valued her, how much, why he thought she was beautiful and intelligent, and he was talking these things. And, and then he wrapped it up, and he picked up his spoon and began to eat his cereal, and then he felt a hand stopping the, um, the spoon from going into his mouth. And his young daughter said, longer, daddy. And so he went on and, and told some more. And then again, he was beginning to take his bite. Again, stopped. Longer, daddy. And this happened multiple times. And it showed him. I mean, he didn't get a lot of breakfast that morning before he had to go to work. Um, he, what he was saying is he, he left there hungry maybe a little bit. But she was starved for his love and affirmation and affection. Um, his daughter sure left there with a full life. He might have been hungry and had to stop for a donut or something like that. But see, the best way is through time. Spending time with one another. That means embrace your family right now. Um, if you're wanting relationship, you got to spend some time. That means meeting at a park, socially distanced, whatever it is, however you do it, phone calling, Zooming. Um, you've got to spend some time with the people that you love. That's why us being separated is painful for all of us because we can't spend that easy time that we had on Sundays. And so I encourage you. But, but here's the other thing. is the, So the best way to love is time. And the best time is now. I'm calling out to you, church, to each one of you, that you would experience God's love in a great way and that you would take time to share that love with others. And that when do we do that? Now. Do it as best as you can outside the church, outside in the world, with your friends. Um, we need to be reminded of God's love for us. And in that, we can love. I know I've uh, talked a lot this morning, but um, I just want to pray with you and pray for you that love would be the marker that we could get back our love. That while the world's in turmoil, we can be in love. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, we just thank you for this day. I pray that you would stir within us. Help us to know that we have a love problem and we must be salt and light of love in this world. We must love even those that disagree with us. Lord, help us to be a people who are known for love. Help us to love those people closest to us. And, and uh, help us to experience and be reminded of, of your great sacrifice for us. So we just love you today. Send us off knowing that we are loved and that you've called us to love as you've loved us. Amen. Thank you again for joining us today, Friends Church. Um, I just want to encourage you to take a moment to reflect on what we just learned and how you can take that into your week moving forward. I challenge you to show your love this week and to be purposefully worshiping God this week and um, see if you can use this time to draw closer to Him and reach out to others and encourage them. 
Thank you for joining us.